our inspired conversations series. So we wanted to put together a panel of amazing people, experts on different subjects, people that are super passionate and deliver some value to you guys. This is going to be in podcast format, like a little interview. At the end, we'll have an option with Q&A in case you have any questions. You've probably seen that today's presentation is all about redefining what it means to be resilient. Emily is going to speak to that in depth. And uh, yeah, I'm super excited. I wanted to just quickly mention that we'll be having, I don't know, seven more of these, I believe. So lots of that coming up, get excited. And so let's just jump right in. I wanna just real quick speak to Emily. I'm gonna read your bio and then have you tell, your, tell us a little bit more about yourself. So Emily is an online health and nutrition coach based in Sacramento. After losing and maintaining a 70 pound weight loss, which is super impressive, she was inspired to help others find sustainable ways to become their best selves through the pursuit of health. Emily now uses and helps others understand how to use their own health journeys to create positive changes in all areas of their lives. I love that bio. Emily, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, so um, like Christina said, I'm here in Sacramento, I'm local. I actually used to be a coach at Inspired Wellness, which is how we are connected. Um, and so I'm an online health and nutrition coach. Um, so I help individuals with their nutrition habits, um, just general health habits. Um, but that journey for me really started um, about 10 years ago when I started to um, go on a weight loss journey for myself. Um, like Christina said, I think I walked across my graduation stage in high school weighing 230 pounds. Um, and just over the course of years and years of hard work, I was able to not only lose weight, um, but maintain that weight loss. And one thing that I really found during that journey was when I was looking for help or looking for resources, I didn't see a lot of people who understood what that was like. Um, I had a lot of people who weren't uh, had been fit their whole lives, didn't understand what it was like to not be fit, um, didn't understand how to make adjustments or present options that they hadn't done themselves, um, and, or not understand when I, things didn't work for them, uh, work for me that worked for them. Um, and so I really wanted to create a safe space for people to be able to be themselves and explore um, how they can best lose weight in a way that allows them to live the life they want to live and be able to maintain that weight loss long-term in a sustainable way with a person who understands what that's like, um, which is where I ended up being where I am. Um, I just felt like it was, I had this wealth of knowledge now. I had already walked through that journey so I could help other people kind of clear that path and be a person who understood get rid of some of the clutter because I had already, you know, done all the bad stuff, done all the like stupid detoxes and like, like bought all the stupid supplements. And now like I can help people decipher what's true and what's not. And I just felt like it was my duty to help other people do it. So here we are. Here we are. And so today we're speaking about resilience, which I think is such an amazing topic in today's times. I love the idea of resilience, even when we don't have a pandemic, but even more so when we have yeah. a pandemic, because I feel like emotional resiliency beyond a weight loss journey is so incredibly important. We spoke about that in the pre-interview, just how important it is. So I, I want to talk about that. What about resilience is important to you? Why is this topic so important to you? And give us a little background on where you discovered your resilience throughout this process and in life in general. Yeah, so I think resilience is so important because that's how we grow, right? Um, we see it in the gym. Um, we, whenever we are trying to grow or we're trying to get to that next place in our fitness journey, um, like let's say we're trying to get stronger, um, we have to face resilience and we have to face resistance to be able to get there. And so taking what we learn in the gym, and this is what I try to talk to people about a lot, is it doesn't matter how much I can squat or how much I can deadlift in the gym outside of these four walls. People don't care about that. But what does matter outside of these four walls that I can take from that is what did I learn in the process of getting to that point, right? I had to fail. I had to work hard. I had to do things that weren't necessarily fun in the moment and that I didn't like. But over the course of time, 
had a big payoff for me, right? So that's what I like to talk to people about a lot. And I mean, that is what I have discovered most that I've been able to take out of my health journey and apply into my everyday life. So when we face hard times like this, I can fall back on that resiliency. So, you know, just like in the gym, if I fail a lift or I fail at a movement or I don't do as well at a workout as I thought I could, it's nothing for me to look back and say, what could I have done better? What can I work on to improve? How can I make this better next time? You know, and, or how can I seek out a person that can help me get better? The same thing happens in everyday life. So when things start to not go the way that I planned, rather than saying like, well, I suck, I'm not good, I can't do this, I should just quit. It, why didn't things go the way that I thought that they should? How can I still make a small improvement, even if it's not the improvement I thought I was going to make? Who can I seek out to help me in this and support me in this journey? What can I do to keep that needle moving, even if it's not moving as fast as I thought it would, or maybe in the same direction that I thought it would? How can I just keep going? And I think that's what resiliency is. Um, resiliency is not this idea of like grit and just gritting your teeth and bearing it and just plowing through or not having emotion or not letting things get to you. Resilience is things are going to get to you. And you, though, have to acknowledge the fact that the, it is happening. So that way you can have power over it rather than it having power over you. And rather than saying, you know, I'm stuck, I ter I'm terrible, what do I, like, why am I even trying? You're able to say, things aren't going the way that I thought that they would. What can I still do in this moment? How can I pivot in a way that I can still pursue my dreams and my ambitions and my goals, even if it doesn't look the way that I thought it was going to look or the timing is not the timing that I thought it would be. So what I'm hearing from this is instead of berating yourself, getting down, getting into the dumps, getting into this mental headspace that's not good for anyone, you get curious. You become a problem solver. One of my favorite yeah. quotes is that action alleviates anxiety. I feel like that's exactly what you're doing with that. So instead of mm -hmm. spiraling out, you're trying to problem solve and figure it out. I want to skip ahead. I know we were going to talk about this further, but I feel like it applies to here because you mentioned something about fun and not fun and how we talked yeah. about how the stuff that's good for us is usually not as sexy as the stuff that's not. The bad habits are a lot easier than the good habits. So can you speak to that a little bit? I just think it's a timely point in the conversation to do that. Speak to that and, and kind of how we resist the good because it, the, the uh, reward is longer term. Yeah. So I um, really adhere to the fact that sometimes bad habits are really hard to break because bad habits um, give us instant gratification. And so a lot of the times, and I'll just equate it to food, right? Um, or nutrition, reaching for that snickerdoodle in the cabinet. I say that because I just made snickerdoodles the other night um, <laughs> in the cabinet. Snickerdoodles is a very specific thing. Yeah, I just made them. So that's why I'm thinking of it. And I'm resisting them in the cabinet right now. Um, so like reaching for that and eating it. Oh my gosh, the instant gratification that I have, right? But if I do that day after day or every single time I open the cabinet, I grab a snickerdoodle. Yeah, it feels awesome in the moment. It tastes awesome. It lights up my senses. It feels good. But, you know, if I do that every day for six months, it's going to feel good every single time I do it. But in six months, I'm going to start to see the negative consequences of that choice, right? What does not feel good is saying, oh, maybe I shouldn't have that right now, or maybe I shouldn't take this action right now. That's hard. That takes, that's a lot of resistance, right? But over the course of six months, I'm going to see the payoff of that choice. And that's really all habits that we have, have that kind of give and take. And that's why bad habits are so hard to stop a lot of the time is because we get that instant gratification. And a lot of times good habits and habits that produce growth, not only are they the not fun choice, sometimes they're the painful choice. Sometimes they're the difficult and the hard choice. 
So working on yourself and doing development work and trying to create a more resilient person isn't fun. Um, I read a quote, I'm going to get it totally wrong, but it was like, self-help sounds really fun, but really it's just like six months of like beating yourself up, right? And like learning your own deepest, darkest secrets about yourself. <laughs> the other end of that, and we can basically take on anything. Exactly. Um, so it's this idea of good habits aren't going to feel good in the moment. You're not going to get instant gratification. But in six months, you're going to look backwards and you're going to say, wow, look at the person that I am today compared to who I was six months ago, or we get into a pandemic and you have all these good habits stored up and as this great toolbox that you can now pull from. Um, that. Have that toolbox versus starting on empty, right? So you're running on few yeah. or you have that, that deposit you've been depositing over the months and years. Yeah. I think too, sometimes that um, instant gratification that we feel from some of those negative habits are also a numbing mechanism for ourselves. Um, and then when we don't have access to it anymore, suddenly we are forced to face our feelings and we're forced to deal with and handle things that we've been avoiding for a long time. And I think that's actually something that's happening right now is a lot of things that we use to numb, um, whether it be, you know, going to the gym possibly, um, or, you know, going out or these different things that we've used as numbing mechanisms are gone and we don't have access to them. And now we're forced to sit and deal with our feelings. And we haven't had to do that before. Right. And we don't, yeah, and we don't know how to deal with it and we don't know what to do. Um, and so that's why I think too, resilience isn't about not feeling things. It's giving yourself the permission to feel things because Yes, it's painful to feel those emotions sometimes. It's painful to feel sadness or anxious or fear or anger. But if I allow myself to feel it, I have the power over it now. And now when I feel that emotion again, I know what to do with it. I know how to handle it. I know that it will end. So essentially, you're not powerless to your circumstances. I feel like yeah. that is the number one reason people struggle to stay on track with any goal that they have. It could be wellness related, could be something else, is they're going, 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 and then, oh, something derails me. And yep. at that point, they're powerless to their circumstances. They're struggling to overcome whatever those circumstances may be. Every single time I've worked with someone, I'm sure you as well, I would say that's probably the biggest hurdle is how to learn that you are not a victim to your, or you don't have to be a victim to your circumstances. You can learn the tools that are needed to overcome them. And that to me, it almost sounds like that is part of the resilience equation. Would you say that's true? 100%. And it's not about not feeling things. Like I said, like, I think the most recent thing that I've been gone through that forced me to do this, it was a really major injury that I had to my ankle. Um, a big moment in your life where you learned a lot about yourself. And I feel like you build up, you built up a lot of resilience through that. Yeah. So I fell in June of last year. Um, and I ended up, I tore, uh, I completely tore two ligaments. I partially tore a third and I fractured my heel bone and my ankle bone. Sounds really um, <laughs> yeah, it was great. Anywhere. Credit to my nervous yeah, credit to my nervous system because I didn't feel it at all. Like I was actually in zero pain. Over life. Um, yeah. So thank you, nervous system and shock for just covering that up for me. Um, but yeah, so I went from, I'm a CrossFitter. Um, I have been for like seven, eight years. Um, so I love running. I love jumping. I love lifting heavy weight. Um, I love doing like weird stuff and gymnastics and all of that. And, um, an ankle injury at first, you're like, oh, that's not that debilitating. It's so debilitating. Like I couldn't do anything. Um, and so I was in a boot for eight weeks. Uh, no, yes, yeah, eight weeks. And then I was going through rehab for about three or four months, hoping that it would heal. Um, and it would do well and it just didn't get better. And so ended up in, well, it got better to a point and then it just kind of stopped. Um, so I ended up actually having to have surgical repair in December, which basically took me back to square one. Um, and I was non-weight bearing in a cast for eight weeks, couldn't drive, couldn't do anything. 
Um, and then now I'm finally able to like start doing some activity again. I still can't jump. I still can't run. I can't do any of that. Mostly just stationary stuff, no dynamic movement. Um, so going through that was something that was uh, difficult, right? And so I got hurt. I was mad. I was angry. I was upset. And, um, but the big thing that I did was I allowed myself to be angry. And that's the thing with resiliency. It's not about not feeling things and just charging ahead. I gave myself permission to be mad and to be upset. And then I just let myself feel and I said, okay, what can I do? I can't run. I can't jump. I can't lift weight, but I can do push-ups. I can do sit-ups. I can hold a plank. I can do curls, right? So exactly. My arms have never been in better shape. Um, arms though. That's your thing. That's like your trademark. I know. And I was like, oh no. Yeah, I'm like, dang it. Like all I want is a bigger butt. And of course I like you hurt my ankle. Know, baby. We're going to do biceps and triceps and shoulders. Yeah, exactly. So the big thing was really just focusing on what I could do instead of what I couldn't. And there were definitely moments where I focused on what I couldn't do. Mm -hmm. And you, everybody has permission to do that and you need to do it. It's cathartic to feel that and to like, just let yourself be upset because pretending like you're not upset, it's, it's like a volcano and it starts to bubble up and it starts to build pressure and then you break. So let yourself feel it. Let yourself get through it. And what I'll say is like, there were definitely moments where I focused on what I couldn't do. And it wasn't, I, I didn't just focus on that day. It seeped into everything. I started to think about, you know, the, oh, I've wasted the last year of my life. Think about the progress that I could have made in this last year if that hadn't happened. You know, how could I have been so stupid to have gotten hurt, right? When it wasn't my fault, like it was a freak accident. I couldn't have prevented it. I was doing everything right. Like it wasn't my fault. Um, and then like, and then that seeps in everything else I do. Well, you know, oh, why aren't my counters as clean as I wish that they were? Like, I can't do anything right. Who am I? Ki I'm kidding myself to think I can even be a nutrition coach. Look at me, right? I'm stuck on this couch. Why would anybody want to work with me? That, those are the thoughts that start to seep in whenever you start to focus on what you can't do. But when I focus on what I can do, think about how empowering that is instead. Despite what happened to me, despite this accident that I couldn't control, I have been able to keep my strength. I have been able to find ways to continue to work out. I have been able to keep track of my nutrition. I have been able to connect with people because I wasn't spending as much time, you know, um, doing like two extra sessions at the gym. I spend that time with people instead. I have discovered new hobbies and habits that I really enjoy and that bring me joy and um, bring me life. Right. So the biggest thing was like, I just continued to show up for myself. And I asked myself, you know, what can I do today? What is in my fear of control. And I think that's what's really hard right now too, is there are a lot of things that feel like they're totally out of our control. Um, there's a lot of stuff we can't control. We can't control this virus. We can't control how the state or the government responds to it. We can't control when things are going to reopen or, um, you know, what the store has in stock when we go or how long the line is. But I can control what I do every day inside my home and how I respond to it. Um, and it's okay to be upset. It's okay to be fearful. It's okay to be angry about it, but you just have to feel it and then pivot. pivot. How can we learn from this? That's my favorite word ever. <laughs> pivot. Yeah. Adapt. Pivot. I, I don't want to say that I don't want this to sound the wrong way, but is it, is it pivot or die or something? Basically we have to be adaptable. We have to be adaptable because if we're not, we're going to get left behind Yeah, with everything in life. And I like that. We didn't talk about this part about your journey. When you had the surgery, you were, you were quarantined because you couldn't go anywhere because hubby was out of town. 
So you experienced yeah. your own quarantine. So it's not like you were, you had the surgery and you could, you know, do all the normal things. You actually had your own version of quarantine. So you learned what it's like to actually be confined to your home home because you, you couldn't go out because you didn't have a hubby there. Oh yeah. So my husband travels for work. Um, he was thankfully able to stay with me for like the first three weeks after my surgery. Um, but because I injured my right foot, I couldn't drive. Um, and when he did have to go back to work, I was still non-weight bearing, still couldn't drive. So I was literally confined to my house. And if I left, I had to like, I had one of those knee scooters. And so that's how I was like walking the, do walking the dog. Um, and that was like the only thing I could do in like, think about how going from like being an athlete to having to crawl up my steps for eight weeks, how demoralizing that can feel. But yeah, I got like quarantine practice. So I, I'm like, this is easy. I'm like, cause I can go for walks. I can ride my bike. I can drive. I can like go to the store where before I was like, I was literally stuck in my house. But I think the biggest lesson that I learned in that was learning how to ask for help. Um, I am classically like, do it yourself. I don't like asking for help. I don't want to be a burden. Um, but I was in a position where I was like, I can't, like, I can't do it for myself. Um, I had my physical therapy center is uh, kind of far away, but they're the absolute best. If you ever get hurt, go to results physical therapy. They're amazing. Um, His knee thing. Yep. Yeah. So, um, and I'm like, man, if I have to, if Brian, my husband's out of town, Brian, and I have to go to physical therapy, it's a $30 lift ride, both directions. So I'm talking about $60 back and forth, two to three days a week, plus my copay. So I was like, yeah, it might be inconvenient, but I have to ask if anybody's willing to help me out here. Like, I don't have an option. Um, Can we talk? And about it was incredible. I want to talk about that for a second. Yeah. I think that's an important piece. So asking for help. How many people struggle? They want to do it all themselves, They, which is great. I, I, lo I love the determination, but I feel like asking for help is an issue in our society. We don't want to have to ask for help because I think maybe underneath that, we think that there's something inadequate about us. But I feel like anyone who gets anywhere, elite athletes, entrepreneurs, people at the top of their field, they don't get there alone. So I'm always fascinated. No. We feel like it's somehow a bad thing that we need help. Can you speak to that a little bit and maybe how you were able to shift your mindset to actually getting help is courageous. It's not... A, like a bad character trait? Yeah. So, I mean, I, again, like I tend to equate things back to the gym because I love the life lessons that we learn in the gym. So if I want to get better at a movement, I one have to be willing to struggle with it um, and fail at it. And I have to be willing to struggle with it and fail at it in front of other people and ask them for help. Right. And when we think about it from an athletic or a health or a gym perspective, it's a no brainer to ask for help. It's not considered a weakness because we've created the safe space in this community where that is the norm. But then when we get out of that area and we have to ask for help in other areas of our life, that it can, in our heads, we start to think of it as a weakness rather than that vulnerability actually is being a strength and being courageous. And I even struggle with that. And I think one of the best things that came out of my injury and the biggest lesson that I learned was how to be willing to be vulnerable and ask for help and lean on a community. And I don't think I realized how superficial some of my relationships were because I was unwilling to be vulnerable and unwilling to be weak with people. Um, and that yeah, exactly. I had what I, I thought I had all these great friends, but I was like, I feel like I don't have anybody that I can ask for help from, right? Because I hadn't allowed myself to go to that place with them mm -hmm. in everyday life. So then when I got to a point where I really, truly needed help, I felt like I didn't have people that I could rely on um, or reach out to, or I felt uncomfortable because I hadn't practiced that with them in the past. Um, and so it forced me to have to practice it. 
um, and have to reach out and have to be okay with the fact that I could not do everything myself and that I was imperfect and that I was going to struggle and that I didn't have it all together um, and be willing to show that to people and say like, hey, I can't really get around my kitchen right now. Um, could you please help me make a meal or like asking my neighbor to take my garbage cans out for me because I couldn't do it. Or we had a, like a little, like my, I had like a circuit break or whatever while like pop whenever I was here home alone and like having to call my neighbor at 10 o'clock at night, asking them if they could flip it for me because I couldn't get to it. And it, all my lights were off upstairs because of it. Right. You know, having to rely on that and create a community but now at the same time, those people feel like they can come to me for that same help. And I would never, ever say no to a person when they came to that. And it's remembering that too. Like if somebody asked the same thing of me that I'm asking of another person, would I think that they were incapable, that they were a burden? Of course I wouldn't. So why do I think that they think the same of me? That reminds me of how the way that we speak to ourselves, we would never speak that way to someone else. The inner dialogue yes. we have sometimes, we would never speak that way to our best friend, a loved one. And yet we think it's okay to have the super negative dialogue just hanging out in our head rent free all day. So I love that. And it sounds to me like, not surprisingly, you were pleasantly surprised by the love that you received. Yeah, I had someone who literally took me to and from physical therapy twice a week. And when she had to go out of town for something, she was on a, like a vacation with her husband. She texted me and she was like, I miss our drives back and forth to physical therapy. And like, she wasn't just driving me to and from physical therapy. She would drive me there and have to wait like an hour and a half while I was at PT wow. and then drive me home afterwards. And I would like give her a Starbucks gift card so she could like chill at Starbucks while I was having my PT done. But like, like to think that that actually her being able to help me brought her joy. Yeah. Right. So sometimes us not asking for help is um, not allowing a person to experience the joy that they get out of being able to help. Like think about how good it feels when you know you were able to help a person, mm. right? And by me not asking for help when I really need it, doesn't allow a person to uh, remove that or prevent the person from being able to experience that joy for themselves. What I take from that is resilience, part of resilience is asking for help and being okay with asking for help. Resilience doesn't mean that we do it on our own. It doesn't mean like you said that we grit our teeth and bear it. It means that we use the resources available to us. And I love that. I wanna get back to resilience because there's something we talked about that I just think people need to hear. And it's a common myth about resilience. And it's about how it's something that you build or it's a characteristic of a person. You talked about kind of like the common myths. Tell me a little bit about what you mean by that. So do you think it's something that we build or do you think it's kind of something that's more innate and it's harder for other people to access? Um, I think it's something that we build 100%. And, but the only way that you build it is to put yourself in positions um, where you're going to have to, right? And I think um, I don't know who else is, but I'm a Brene Brown junkie. Um, <laughs> I tell everybody that I have a unpaid part-time job <laughs> as a Brene Brown evangelist. I'm her like number one fan club member, right? Like just so popular. She has a lot of us fangirls who just sing her praises. Yeah, all the time. So she actually has um, a podcast now. And one of her first or second episodes of it, she talked about how difficult um, doing new things and experiencing new things are. And I think it plays into resilience a lot. And so um, she talked about how, like, new is hard, because we don't like experiencing the discomfort of new. And we're so afraid and scared of the vulnerability that we stop trying or doing new things 
But when we stop trying and doing new things, we stop growing. And when we stop growing, we stop living, right? And so that's kind of where we are, I think, as a culture, is we are so afraid to fail and put ourselves in a position that we actually, it, where we're going to fail, that we stop trying and we stop trying new things and we stop, um, and in that case, we stop growing. And so that's why resilience is something that grows. Um, if you want to be resilient, though, you're going to have to be willing to put yourself in positions where you practice resiliency. And that, frankly, that sucks, right? <laughs> because you have to grow resiliency, you have to be willing to fail, or have things not come out the way that you thought that they would, um, or do things that are difficult, and that you're going to struggle with, and that you're going to have to persevere through. Um, but I don't think it's something that you're born with. Um, I think that we all have the same aptitude for resiliency. It's if you choose to practice it. And it's if you choose, it's a choice. It's a choice that you make um, when things happen. And you like you can choose. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna, well, you talked about um, optimism and gratitude. And I, I think I wanted to actually ask you about that because to me, that's what you're saying right now. Would you say that optimism is, is being happy all the time? No, not at all. Um, optimism is, choose it, it goes back a little bit to that idea of like, what can I do instead of what can't I do? Um, and it's that idea of how can I, I'm not going to let this setback prevent me from achieving my goal or prevent me from pursuing my ambition. I am still optimistic about my ability to achieve it. I am optimistic that businesses will reopen. I am optimistic that this virus will, you know, this pandemic or whatever will settle, right? That doesn't mean that I'm happy that it's happening. That doesn't mean that I'm filled with joy over the fact that businesses are closed and small businesses are struggling. Um, but I am optimistic about the outcome. I know and feel hope and have the faith that things will work out. Um, and that, you know, I'm not going to lose all my strength during this time frame. I'm not going to let my nutrition fall to the wayside when you think about it from a health perspective. My hard work up to this point was not for nothing. Um, but it takes action to maintain those things. So what can I do today to keep moving forward? What It might not look the way that I thought it would. It might not happen in the timing that I thought that it would, but it's still going to happen. I'm still going to achieve this goal. I'm still going to pursue this ambition. I'm not going to let what's happening stop me, but it might slow me down. It might be like some weird detour. I might have to redo some things that I did previously but I'm going to keep going and you're going to find things in life that aren't worth continuing. Um, sometimes you're going to hit that roadblock and you're going to realize maybe this wasn't for me and that's okay too. Your why can change, your dreams can change, your goals can change, but you'll know when it's the right thing too, because it won't matter what obstacles you face. You're going to keep working towards it. But some of that is to that victim mentality you talked about, even goals that we really want that we've tried, um, getting out of that victim mentality um, to where rather than things happening to us and, oh, I couldn't do it because this happened and my life is crazy and my schedule's out of control and all this stuff. Well, what could you have done anyway? Like you might not have been able to do the 10 things that you thought you were going to do, but could you have done three of them? Or could you have done 50% of the 10 things? rather than 0% of the 10 things. Oh. Um, it's those types of mindsets of like, okay, things aren't going the way that I thought that they would. I don't really like how things are going right now. Um, you know, but what can I do anyway? But still, at least, I might not be able to like run the whole lap, but can I take a couple steps? It's those types of questions. So I've been doing this with my own journey during quarantine and during COVID-19. One thing I have been doing is controlling my consumption of information 
And to me, that's its own form of optimism. Like you said, it doesn't mean that I'm excited and oh my gosh, but it means that I recognize that I need to control my consumption because what was happening is things would just be coming at me all day. All the statistics, all the data, all the ways in which everything is just going to hell basically. And I found that I had this low level anxiety all day long. It just would not go away. And it got in the way of what we're talking about today, being resilient, being proactive, not being a victim. I would fall into my thoughts and I would just kind of like marinate in them. So it's really helped me to stop reading the news. I read the tidbits and that's, that's it. I'm not going to consume endless articles all day long, things like that. I want to know what are some of the things that you're doing? Maybe give me like a, a top three to five list. What are you doing on a daily basis to keep your head above water, if not your whole body above water during quarantine, during COVID-19? I think I would love to give people some really good actionable strategies that they can start trying to implement to start to build up that resilience muscle. Because like you said, we build it, we have to do it every day. So I'm curious, what are some of the habits that you're exhibiting on a daily basis that you feel is contributing to your ability to navigate this? Because I've been following you, I stalk you on social media and <laughs> you seem a lot more chipper than the average person right now. And I know a lot of that is because you've done so much work on yourself. So can you share with us some of those things that you're doing, some actionable strategies that people can do every day? Yeah. So one big thing is I focus on what's in the scope of my control. So um, I, like you, had this moment where I realized, oh my gosh, I'm looking at the news too much. And it's giving me this like low level anxiety that, and sometimes high level anxiety that just like isn't going away. I had like this baseline medium anxiety that wasn't going anywhere. Um, and while it's super important to be informed and know what's going on, how much information is too much information? And when does it come from a place of I need to know this versus I'm just am trying to consume data because consuming data makes me feel like I have a sense of control over it, right? Like this knowledge is power idea. So like I used to be terrified of flying. Um, and so I like was actually obsessed with learning about how planes fly because it gave me like this sense of control over it and it eased my anxiety. Huh? Yeah, no, me too. I wanted to just basically become yeah. an aviation expert. Yeah, or like I was afraid of tornadoes and I would always watch like storm chasers and my husband would be like, why are you watching this? You're afraid of tornadoes. And I'm like, but the more I know about it, the less scary it is, right? For therapy. But yeah, but the reality is, is like we don't have control over it. Um, and so it's like, okay, am I consuming this because I actually need to know it? Or am I doing it because I'm trying to have this false sense of control over something that's uncontrollable? So what's in my scope of control? And so then focusing on the things that I can actually control brings me a lot of joy and makes me actually really happy because I'm like, you know, I can do this and I can control this. And I'm really excited about that. And I'm going to do my best at those things that I'm able to do. And you know, um, so that's a big thing. Like I just focus on the things that are in the scope of my control because when I focus about the things that can't, it makes me feel really powerless and it makes me feel really anxious and it makes me feel like things aren't worthwhile. It makes me feel like, you know, my goals and my ambitions that I have aren't worth working towards because who freaking knows what's going to happen in the next six months, right? So I just have to worry about today, right now, what's in my control. Um, the other big thing that I do is I give myself um, like little wins or things to be, look forward to and to be excited about. Um, and I learned this during my, my personal ankle quarantine um, when I would be alone in the house was like, how am I going to pass the time when I'm literally stuck in my house, like would not leave my home for four to five days at a time, right? I'm gonna, and I wasn't working, so I couldn't go to the gym. What, how am I gonna pass the time? And so giving myself little things to look forward to, even if they're super small, like I got really excited to watch Wheel of Fortune at night at like 7.30. Like that gave me something to look forward to, or, oh, I'm gonna order takeout from this restaurant. Um, and that, gives me something to look forward to today, or it can be like, oh, Thursday, we're going to do takeout and we're going to do this thing. And it's going to be fun. Like Brian and I ordered from Tank House a couple weeks ago. 
and um, the people who own Tank House own Jungle Bird, and they do like tiki drinks. Um, so, and you can get them to go now. So we were like, oh, we're gonna order Tank House. We're gonna get these tiki drinks. I'm gonna wear my um, Hawaiian shirt while we have dinner, and like like just making like little fun things like that um and something to look forward to my best friend lives on the east coast and we have somehow over the last six months um slowly ended up buying like the exact same outfit like I was like hey I got this shirt do you like it yeah and like hey I was thinking about buying some house slippers um oh these are on sale I'm gonna buy them too and then we both ended up getting like these ridiculous denim overalls because they were on sale from old Navy. So one day we both were like, hey, let's have a twin day across the country. And I looked forward to it all week. And like, it was literally just putting on the same outfit as my best friend on the East Coast. And we're not even going to see each other, right? And just knowing that, you know, it gave me something to look forward to. And it was so small and it was so silly. But that's the thing, like, just give yourself these little tiny wins and these little things to look forward to. And it can be something small where you're like, oh, that's dumb. But it's not. If it's something that makes you happy and excited, like, be happy and excited about it. It's fun, right? Like, do those little things. Actually, if it makes you happy, it fulfills you, that's a really big deal, especially in today's times. Yeah. Um, And then the other thing is I, rather than giving myself this massive to-do list, I give myself a to-done list, which is what I like to refer to it as. So, I might have a to-do list that's like 50 or 60 things long. Um, And at the end of the day, I might only achieve like three or four of them. And I started to realize that I was feeling really upset or negative about myself because of how much I did not get done rather than thinking about the things that I had been able to accomplish that day. So I might have my big massive to-do list, but every day I look at it and I say, okay, for today to be a win, what are the things that I have to do? And it's like three or four things maximum. And these are things that I know I can complete during a day. And then if I complete them, I can feel like, okay, today was a success. If I do all of them and I do something else on top of it, just an added bonus, that's great. Um, So then I feel like, oh, I can count today as a win because I accomplished the things that I set out to accomplish today rather than focusing on, well, I did four things, but there's also these like 30 other things that I didn't do, which is what tends to happen when you just have a to-do list. So biggest thing, focus on what you can control, give yourself little wins and things to look forward to, and give yourself a to-done list rather than a to-do list. So age of quarantine to done list might just be, you know, showering, brushing your teeth, looking all, I put some concealer on today. I may or may not have. Okay. (laughs) I definitely started doing my hair for a couple reasons. One, um, it makes me feel good. Um, so I noticed like when I did my hair, I felt like I held myself a little bit better. I tried to do more things. I felt happier right? Because I felt good about myself. And also I tend to not throw it up into a bun as often if I do it. And I'm like, I like my little like baby hairs, like I had a bunch of hair fall out from stress. And so whenever I pull it back a lot, it damages it. So doing my hair also helps me not damage those little baby hairs that are growing back in. The little things, the little things matter. Yeah. You said. <laughs> So, but no, when I did my makeup today for this, I realized I was like, I don't even remember what's the order I normally do my makeup in. Like, do my, do I do my eye makeup and then my foundation or do I do my foundation and then my eye makeup? Like what color do I normally use? Like I, like, I was like, I don't even remember how to do all this. I need to share a secret with you since we're sharing secrets now. I forgot to brush my teeth for two days straight and I didn't realize it until, you know, you feel that film over your teeth and you're just thinking like something's off. And then I realized my husband calls them teeth sweaters. (laughs) Yes. Oh my gosh. Sweaters. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So absolutely. Our, our whole routine is different. There's days where I work straight up in my robe all day. Although I will say that the day mm-hmm. get a little cute, like hair or some makeup, I feel better because every day kind of blends into the next right now. So I totally agree with breaking that up. So um, as we wrap up, I want to know if there's anything else that we didn't touch on that you really want to make sure everyone hears about. I feel like we, we got to some really good stuff, but 
is definitely going to be impactful. But is there anything that you, that comes to mind that you're like, oh, wait, I want to make sure that they don't miss this. I think the biggest takeaway is that for you to be capable of doing hard things and achieving hard goals, you have to be willing to do hard things. Um, And that growth is painful a lot of the time. And while pain sucks and you should allow yourself to feel pain and you should allow yourself to feel angry or sad or upset about it, you also have to get takeaways from it. Don't let pain and don't let struggle be meaningless um, because it, like it can easily become meaningless or it can make, um, you know, feel, make you feel worthless. But there is so much to be learned from pain. There is so much to be learned from struggle. Um, and while you don't have to assign meaning to everything, I'm not trying to say like, oh, everything happens for a reason. That's not what I'm saying at all but you can make pain purposeful. You don't have to allow pain to be just pain. There are lessons you can learn from it and there are things that you can take away from it. Um, And pain and struggle and having to face resilience, that is what triggers change. So if you want a different life, if you want things to change, if you want your mindset to change, if you want your life to change, you're going to have to experience struggle and failure And be able to say, yes, I am feeling this. Yes, I am struggling, but I'm not going to let that stop me. How can I feel this pain, but also learn from this pain and use it as something that can catapult me? So we're all going through something really terrible right now um, that none of us have done. None of us have a playbook for this. And we can get mad that, you know, places aren't doing the things that we thought that they should or we're not getting the services that we thought that we should from something, or we're not getting the answers that we wish that we had, but none of us had a playbook for this. Um, But we can all come out of this a little bit better than we went into it, I think. Um, I think that it's really going to give us something to realize, like, what was important to us? What were the things that I was doing before just to kind of, like, you know, make other people happy rather than myself? Um, how was I numbing myself previously that I'm not now because I don't have access to it? Um, so, you know, pain doesn't have to be purposeless. You can give it meaning um, and don't let it be worthless. Every, everything that you go through can teach you a lesson and can catapult you into a new version of yourself. I love that. I feel like you hit it out of the park. Great way, <laughs> great way to go out with a bang. Before we go, tell people where they can find you on social media, wherever you prefer. Yeah, so I'm mostly active on Instagram. Um, That's where you can find me. I'm always in my DMs. I'm always on my stories and I'm posting stuff. (laughs) Yes, so um, if you like food um, or you like dogs, I post a lot about my little mini schnauzer, Oscar. He's my best friend. He's the coolest. Um, you can find me on Instagram. That's the best place to get in contact with me or just kind of follow along with my journey. Um, and it's at E G R F S K Y. So it's E and then my last name with no vowels. There we go. Okay. So thank you so much. I really, yeah, of course. Conversation. This is a topic that's to me so, so timely. And a lot of people are at home struggling right now. And the number one thing I took away is what we actually just went over And it's just not, or making your pain purposeful. That's huge. That to me is huge because so many people are experiencing pain and some of it's little, some of it's big, but can we make it purposeful? Can we get curious? I heard that a lot throughout all of what you were saying is getting curious. Do not become Mm -hmm. to your own thoughts. And I just love that. So thank you for sharing with everyone and thank you your message. You're super inspiring. It's also, like you said, been funded reconnect. I know we connect a little bit on something. I know. We we're able to like fully reconnect, which is awesome. So t- that to me is a silver lining, you know, quarantine reconnects you. <laughs> so yes. first- yeah, exactly. I'm talking to people that I haven't talked to in a really long time or like having convers like doing like zoom hangouts with people that I'm like, Oh, I never had time for this. And I'm like, I totally had time for this before. I just wasn't choosing to. Yeah, so absolutely. So before we go, I actually just wanted to see, I'm going to hop on Facebook since we are doing this in a live format for this particular section. Anyone have any questions? Oops, I'm on live. Hold on. Um, Does anyone have any questions for Emily? 
about this topic, anything you want to mention, we've got, um, we can wait for like 30 to 60 seconds and see because there is a delay. And if not, anything that comes up after the fact, what I'll do is you're in our group. So I will um, tag yeah. if anyone has anything specific about. Yeah, of course. And people can always reach out to me too. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I have plenty of time right now. So <laughs> that is thinking this the other day because I don't know I'm kind of a hermit nowadays I I was a hermit before becoming a mom now that I'm a mom I'm like next level hermit and yeah but I feel like it's funny like if you give someone an excuse nowadays they know you're lying because you're not doing anything you're just sitting at home yeah <laughs> I know yeah somebody we're doing like a little zoom game night with my husband's family online tonight and we were like, what time works for everybody? And he asked me what time works. And I was like, well, I have a lot going on today. So, <laughs> you know, I don't know if I have time. Be able to pencil you in, in between yeah. my pants, like my bed pants to my couch pants. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We don't have any questions coming in right now. Again, thank you so much. And yeah. I look forward to reconnecting with you even further. Have a good day. I know. I'm excited. Yeah, you too. Have a good day, guys. All right. Talk to you later. Yep. Bye. Bye.